You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. My name is Pete Betke. I'm uh, the director of the F.A. Hayek program uh, for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics at George Mason University and Mercatus Center. And I'm really excited uh, to kick off this semester uh, with this discussion of Vlad Tarko's uh, book. Um, we have a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, panel here uh, that have a long history and connection with the Ostroms. Uh, when I moved to George Mason University in 1998, uh, one of the first things that we did, um, I was already a fellow at Mansur Olson's uh, Institute for Research in the Informal Sector. And so one of the things that we did was we started a project over at Mercatus called the Global Prosperity Initiative, which was to study economies in transition, uh, development economies and whatnot. And one of the first hires that we made over there to build out our program was my colleague Paul Alajika. And the reason why uh, is because of the whole relationship between the public choice, the Austrian school and the Bloomington school uh, that Paul was a perfect representative of. Um, and um, the, uh, in, the, in the late, in the 1980s, uh, Vincent Ostrom had tried to develop a co-program uh, with George Mason University and Jim Buchanan in particular in constitutional political economy uh, because that was really the only uh, places that were studying the constitutional level of analysis and the issues of institutions and the institutional analysis of development. It's hard for all of you now who are studying economics to realize that when Vincent edited his book on the institutional, uh, Rethinking Institutions and Economic Development, which I think was an edited book through the Institute for Contemporary Society in 1985 or something like that, he was a revolutionary uh, for uh, bringing those ideas to bear. And Paul, uh, who was a student of the Ostroms, as well as, as uh, also a student of, of public choice in the Austrian school. We bid him away from the Hudson Institute and we're able to get him to come here and, and work with us and build out that program. And in the process of that, we ended up by uh, you know, building up our capabilities uh, very strongly with regard to the, the, the Bloomington School. And in 2005, I think, maybe it's a little earlier, that we gave uh, through the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order. Uh, we had a special conference on the Ostroms and uh, uh, had a special issue of, of Journal of, of uh, Economic Organization and Behavior. And uh, uh, Mike uh, was a participant in that program. Um, and during some of the seminars, Bobby was a discussion leader as a, in, in those programs. And so it's really exciting to see all of this come about. And uh, so uh, the way this will go is our normal drill. Vlad will have. Uh, his uh, 20 minutes or so to introduce the book, uh, which is, a, um, I should just say, is a, the first uh, intellectual biography on Eleanor Ostrom and, and uh, thorough and, and complete one of that. And then, uh, and then we'll have Mike and then we'll hear from Bobby and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But so please, oh, and Vlad Tarko is now a assistant professor at Dickinson College in Carlisle, in Carlisle Pennsylvania. Mike McGinnis is the associate dean um, in the College of Arts and Sciences at the Indiana University. And Bobby Hertzberg is a senior distinguished fellow here in our Hayek program after uh, being also at Templeton and Utah State for, for many years and before that at Indiana University as well. So, Vlad, the floor is yours. And please join me in welcoming Vlad Tark. Thank you, Pete. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I was a student here at Mason for four years. So almost every week I participated in this uh, uh, seminar. So now being here a presenter is really flattering. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation. So uh, in this 20 minutes, so uh, I want to talk about the last uh, uh, chapter in the book, which is about uh, how do you deal 
with complex emergent orders, and in particular, what kind of alternatives we have to a representative agent model. Uh, so part of this uh, is, so I'm gonna talk about what's known as the institutional analysis and development fr framework, which is this alternative, I will say, to the representative agent model. Uh, and this framework has uh, gathered a lot of attention from practical uh, minded people. Right? So there are lots and lots of practical applications using this framework. And what's sometimes lost is the connection to the philosophy behind it. Uh, so let me start with this quote from Eleanor Ostrom, which says, there is no way you can write about my work without paying attention to Vincent. So in a sense, the uh, institutional analysis and development framework tries to ad uh, address a problem, a philosophical problem that Vincent Ostrom was interested in, which is how do you describe complex emergent orders uh, properly, right? So Eleanor Ostrom basically gave her solution to this problem, and I wanna uh, talk about this. Uh, so, you know, this is, as I was saying, has gathered a lot of attention in, in practical applications, but it has a deep philosophy behind it. So why would you bother with the philosophy? So on one hand, the IAD framework may not be perfect. So there are actually important attempts to uh, go beyond it, in particular what's known as the socio-ecological systems framework. Uh, so initially the IAD framework was described, uh, was used to describe small scale societies. So uh, various applications, uh, relatively small scales. So the question then is, how far can you use this uh, at, at larger scales? And this socio-ecological systems framework is kind of an update that tries to address large scale systems. But uh, when they're building this uh, framework, sometimes at least, they're kind of losing uh, um, attention on the philosophy, so it's kind of just a purely inductive uh, um, attempt which has some issues. And on the other hand, it's useful to pay attention to the philosophy if you're trying to use the framework outside of its uh, original uh, uh, applications, right? So initially, it was used to address tragedy of the commons uh, problems and so on. Uh, one example of how this framework is used outside of that context is a book uh, edited by uh, Charlotte Hess and Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, which applies the IAD framework to understand knowledge problems and information, uh, right? So quite different uh, topic, right? So you may also <coughs> think of many other problems, which uh, many other topics which face this exact same issue. How do you describe an emergent order? Okay, so for instance, could the IAD framework be applied in say macroeconomics or other such topics? Um, okay, so what is the task Okay, we have complex emergent orders and we want to have a framework, uh, kind of a language to uh, describe those emergent orders. So how do you do that uh, in a systematic way and in a way that allows you to kind of have the same language across many different uh, examples such that you can draw um, lessons from one case that could be used in another case and so on. So instead of just having uh, only very specific analyses, you wanna have this kind of broader language that allows you to draw uh, lessons from one case to another. Uh, so as Vincent Ostrom put it, right, what we want is to penetrate an illusion of chaos, discerning regularities that appear to be created by an invisible hand. Right, so we're talking about emergent orders. Uh, so these have, you know, often have this kind of illusion of chaos, right? But there are these patterns and regularities which occur under this illusion of chaos. And an important thing he mentions here is that this order of this kind of complex uh, situation is often counterintuitive, right? So I'm gonna put more emphasis on this counterintuition, right? The fact that uh, we're often tempted to try to understand complex orders in a kind of intuitive fashion. So the most common attempt 
to make to simplify a complex system is what's known as the intentional stance. Basically, you're applying the rational choice model at a higher level, right? So, for example, you can talk about firms as maximizing expected profit, right? So, firm now, you know, the firm itself doesn't really have goals, or purposes, beliefs, but we're describing it as if it does, right? And this works pretty well with firms. Uh, but we do this with many, many other examples, right? So for example, we can talk about, uh, say, a culture, uh, and we talk about mentalities as if the society as a whole is an agent which has these kind of beliefs, right? That's much more problematic than, say, when we're talking about a firm from this kind of intentional stance perspective. Now, the, an important thing to notice about this uh, approach to complexity is that it's self-similar. What, what me that means is that you have the same structure uh, appearing at different levels, right? So you have, say, the individual is described by the rational choice model, has intentions, has beliefs. Then, say, the individuals combine into organization like firms. Now, the firm uh, is described as if it has intentions and beliefs. Then, say, the firms uh, can gather in, say, sectors of the economy. So sometimes, say, you see People talk about, say, the tech sector, uh, you know, what ideology is pervasive in the tech sector, what does the tech sector want, right? So it's as if we're, we're describing the tech sector as a whole as an entity which has goals and beliefs. Uh, then you can think of different sectors of the economy, you know, combining and forming a whole economy as a whole. And sometimes we even talk about the whole economy as if it's a single entity with goals and beliefs. Say, for instance, uh, when we're applying the comparative advantage model to international trade, that's basically as if the countries were individuals, uh, right? So you can think of comparative advantage. You can apply it to individuals, to firms, uh, to countries as a whole, right? So it's the same kind of structure that occurs again and again at different levels. Uh, so that's what it means to be self-similar. And this is a, a very powerful feature because you don't need to invent something new at each new level of organization, okay? So now the question is, this kind of uh, approach, right, the intentional stance, does it really work? When does it work? How do you tell when it doesn't work? And what alternatives do you have when it doesn't work? Okay, so as I mentioned, say, when you're applying it to firms, looks that it works pretty well. Say, if you're trying to do Marxist class theory, Right there, you would have the social classes. They're supposed to have ideologies, uh, interests, beliefs. That doesn't work very well on a purely descriptive uh, ground, right? So it doesn't stay. If you're describing history as a class struggle, that doesn't fit history very well. So that doesn't work very well. And there are these kind of intermediary uh, cases, like, say, you can think of governments as uh, maximizing expected revenues. Again, government here is one entity. Uh, assumed to be one entity with goals and interests. Uh, okay, so that doesn't work as well as firms. Okay, we have this whole literature of micro foundations of a macroeconomics, which basically means you're having this representative agent and you're applying uh, uh, optimization issues to uh, problems to this whole representative issue in macroeconomics. You know, that's, uh, you know, Many people are fans of this, but then it's uh, less uh, uh, clear that it's a good approach than, say, firms maximizing expected profits. Uh, you can get some hints of why some of these work better than others. So to give you an example, uh, so it turns out, say, if you're spending $100 at Walmart, Walmart would get like $2 in profit, but the local government will get something like $6 or even $10, depending where you are. So it looks like the local government has a much stronger incentive uh, with respect to you know, running Walmart well than the actual w owners of Walmart do. Right? So perhaps the local government should actually run Walmart rather than the owners because they have like several times over a greater incentive to do that. Right? Now, that's not true. Right? What's the problem there? Okay, the problem is that when you're thinking of the government as uh, an entity with goals and beliefs, that doesn't work as well 
as the firm having goals. Uh, okay, so that would be kind of an example uh, of the empirical stuff. You can think of how to assess when a model doesn't really work, right? So it's not obvious that when you're having this Leviathan model of government is completely wrong, right? But it's not as good as the standard model of firms. Uh, okay, so this matters. It matters if you have the wrong model of uh, a complex system because we use these models to assess the performance of these systems. Right, so here's a quote from Ellen Rostrom. She says, the presence of order in the world is largely dependent upon the theories to understand the world. Right, so if you have the wrong theory, say you're applying uh, this kind of representative uh, agent model, say in macroeconomics, and suppose that is a mistaken model, right, that will give you hints of what to do, say about macroeconomics, that may turn out to be very mistaken. Right, so having a mistaken model of a complex system can have dramatic bad consequences. So it really matters to uh, have a good way to understand complex emergent systems. Uh, so you can think of two ways in which this, this intentional stance can fail. One way is perhaps you have defined the larger entity wrong. Right, so say you over-aggregated something like the Marxist class theory. Uh, or you may have aggregated it, like the, you set the boundaries wrong. Okay, so to give you an example of this, uh, say many uh, critiques of Tibu competition uh, look at the following. They say, well, Tibu competition probably doesn't work very well because when we're looking at uh, the knowledge that average citizens have, turns out they have virtually no knowledge of policies across the jurisdictions, right? So if you ask them what, what tax rates are across jurisdictions, they have no idea. Which jurisdiction has better schools, they have no idea, right? So it turns out, well, the Tibu competition cannot possibly work given that the uh, average citizen doesn't know what it's supposed to know in that model. Right? That's actually a, a wrong critique of the Tibu competition because what matters in the Tibu competition is the marginal citizen. Right? So say if you want to move, say suppose you're upset about high tax rate or upset about the quality of schools, then you are going to be in that small minority of people who do get informed about this kind of issue. Right? So here you can still have kind of a representative agent uh, approach to understand like the representative citizen that enters the Tibu competition model, but if you're thinking the representative citizen is the average citizen, you're gonna get the wrong conclusion as opposed to say the, the representative uh, citizen is the marginal citizen who would move. Okay, so this would be like you just didn't draw the boundaries right, but perhaps there is a good entity that could be described with the intentional stance. But sometimes it could be that there is no such system, right? So basically the intentional stance fails completely. That is just, there is no entity uh, that at that level could still be described uh, with the rational choice uh, model uh, and it would still good, give good uh, predictions, right? So say, uh, Vincent Ostrom was very adamant that this was indeed the case, say, with governments, right? So he didn't like when people talked about government as a single entity, right? Because governments, in fact, uh, you know, are this kind of uh, complex uh, system. And if you think the government is one entity, that's going to give you uh, mistaken uh, expectations about what governments do. You will not understand why governments actually do various things that they do. And he thought there's no way you could still apply, say, the intentional stance there. Uh, right? So then the, if, if you believe this, that you found a certain level uh, where you, there is just no way to have a, to define an entity with goals and uh, beliefs that will still give you accurate uh, expectations, then what else, right? What else would you use to make sense of a very complex order, okay? So that's where the uh, in 
the IAD framework comes in. That's kind of the philosophy behind this framework. Right? So in practice, uh, the way in which they came up with the framework was that they looked at many case studies, like hundreds of case studies, and they were trying to find a language that was useful across cases. Right? So it was, to a large extent, this kind of inductive uh, uh, effort, right? but it was an inductive effort that had this kind of philosophy behind it, which is that we are looking for a way to describe emergent systems that's different than the intentional stance, the representative agent approach to simplifying complexity. Uh, so to give you a very brief uh, uh, overview of how this model works. So importantly, this is also a self-similar model. Right? So the, the way, so in the same way as you had the same structure occurring at different levels, here again, you would have these action arenas and you can have nested action arenas. So you have what is an agent in one, at one level, you can go inside the agent, zoom in, and there's an action arena there. Uh, you know, so instead of having the agent with this, just the instantial stance, you have this kind of more complex way to look at, uh, at them. So the way you look at them, you have this distinction between action arena and action situation. You can think of the action arena as kind of a dictionary of all the things that could happen, right? Who can be involved? What kind of institutional positions there are there? What kind of events could happen? Uh, and what kind of resources people are uh, interested about? Uh, so an action situation is just uh, the intersection of many of, of these, right? Of certain actors, in the action situations may not involve all the possible actors, just the subset. It will be just a few events that can trigger the action situation. It could be just few of the resources involved. Uh, so it's, it's the action situation which actually de determines outcomes, right? So within an action arena, over time or even in parallel, different action situations can occur. And each action situation, right, you would uh, kind of do a, an analysis of it. And this works because you've greatly simplified the problem, right? Instead of having all this, there's this massive complexity, many people involved, many rules involved, many resources, many possible events. You're now reducing it to just one simple, relatively simple action situation. Sometimes you can even have like a game theory model for the action situation. Uh, so you can analyze what happens there. Uh, you know, what, how do uh, actors uh, interact uh, in the action situation? What outcomes occur? And you can think about, you know, why say the uh, outcomes that occurred are not as good as uh, could have been. So you can think of redesigning some of the rules. Uh, so you can think of this as being this kind of analysis being done by an outside observer, but also you can think of it as the participants themselves find themselves in action situations and go through this uh, uh, analysis and evaluation and attempt to reform. Uh, you can go deeper, say, inside the action situation uh, and you can analyze different types of rules that exist, right? So for example, it boundary rules like who can be involved like right? not perhaps not all the people are eligible to participate in a certain action situation then the participants can have different institutional positions right so certain rights and obligations that are assigned to specific people and as a result of those rights and obligations say a person now can have a greater impact uh, than otherwise uh, right and you can think there are several other types of rules, like what kind of information each person is allowed to have. Uh, say, if they have collective uh, actions, what kind of aggregation rules they have there. Right? How exactly are they going to be engaged in collective choice? Uh, okay, so notice this is much more complicated than just having an entity and saying it has goals, it has these beliefs, and we just do an optimization problem. Right? So perhaps this is too complicated. Uh, but you know this is the proposal. So the idea is you could ha use this kind of framework to try to analyze various types of uh, complex systems, emergent systems. Okay, it has been used uh, 
you know, like hundreds of times, uh, and you can wonder, can it be used outside of the analysis of, say, tragedies of the commons in small-scale societies? Perhaps some changes need to be made. Perhaps it could be simplified somehow. Perhaps it needs to be, uh, it's insufficiently complex. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I'm Bobby Herzberg, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to, um, first of all, to have some time to really carefully go through this book um, and uh, read it. Read a subject matter I feel like I know a bit about, mm -hmm. having sort of lived it, and it, I lived it during a time when my memory was a lot better. So. <laughs> I, it's actually stronger than a lot of things that are more recent, so that's kind of problematic. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, so it was, it was nice, uh, but it's also when you are familiar with a, an area and uh, you have admiration uh, for a body of work and for the people who have uh, uh, put that body of work together, uh, it's nice to have a check on that and to see it through someone else's eyes and to see what they see when they read, uh, especially when they read with, again, the same kind of um, care and admiration uh, because they're not just reading it as, that's wrong, you know, or it's, you know, the state, the state, the state should do it. Every time you, anyone says the state, I always see Vincent with, like, smoke coming out of his ears because <laughs> if you said that in a seminar, that's exactly what would happen, and, and it was not, there was no question that it would be smoke. Um, you know, he didn't even smoke, and it still was smoke. Uh, so let me, anyway, let me go through. I'm so pleased that Vlad took the time to um, go through that last chapter because I'm going to pretty much ignore it, not, not entirely, but um, a little bit and spend a lot more time uh, just sort of uh, perusing through the beginning. And the reason is I think he's done a great job in that last chapter to sort of talk about the accumulation of knowledge uh, that the Ostroms and the Bloomington School have put together but what I think is so great about this book and what I found uh, so very appealing is he does it by really taking us on Lynn Ostrom's intellectual journey. Mm -hmm. He takes it through Vincent and through the work of the workshop and many, many, many other colleagues uh, to give us a sense of how she got to that point. And I think it's especially useful for students um, so if you haven't had a chance to read this book, it's a fairly quick read. It didn't sound like it with the, all the charts and the frameworks and all that in the sense that, of what you see because it does look so incredibly complex at that point. Uh, but it does. It reads very well. It's short. It's, it, it covers a lot of terrain and it does it in a rather you know, chatty fashion so that you get a real sense of the characters and the people uh, that put this together, and I especially liked that. Um, I found that to be um, useful. And the reason is, when you are a student and you see these things all laid out in that fashion, you think, my mind just does not work that way. I don't have 52,000 boxes in a framework. And now we know if you zoom out, you can get even more boxes. And if you zoom in, you can cut the number of boxes. But there are boxes and boxes and boxes because the world is complex. And I think, how would I ever know what went into that model? But that's not how models are created, and it's not how intellectual journeys are, are created. They start with understanding a certain puzzle and a certain idea and moving through that puzzle and idea to create more complex and more sophisticated and more interesting and generally applicable type of theory. And that's exactly the journey that Eleanor Ostrom took on it. And so I really appreciate that uh, Vlad has done a great job of actually characterizing that. Now, one little quibble I do have is when you're reading it and you're just getting into the book, and if any of you have uh, had some time to do that so far, you'll note you start to say, it says Eleanor Ostrom here, but I keep reading about this Vincent character a whole lot. And in that first part of the book, it's, it's really the Ostrom's intellectual biography as much as it is uh, Eleanor Ostrom's 
intellectual biography. Now, so at first I'm going, hmm, maybe it's mistitled. Maybe he's trying to fit things in here that just, you know, really do you need to have it in there in the way that it's being presented. But I, I, after reading the whole book and uh, thinking about it for a while, it's exactly the way it should be. Because in fact, their journey began together and with the interaction and contestation and respect for each other uh, that that created. Now many look at that period of time as thinking Vincent did the theory and Lynn did the empirical analysis. But those of us who knew them at the time and, and who saw and observed the way in which they did work recognize very quickly that that's not the way it worked. That both did theory and both did empirical work. Now Vincent was a little bit different kind of empirical work sometimes that we did. But there's a quote from um, uh, Vlad here and it says, um, when he's talking about this sort of idea of, of linking these things together. And he's talking about Vincent here, and he says, to understand the meaning of a text, you have to be able to identify the ways in which the world would be different depending on whether the texts were true or false. As a professor, you would not believe that your students have truly understand a reading, understood a reading, uh, be it as philosophical as it may be, unless they are able to derive empirically testable hypotheses from it. Undoubtedly, Eleanor Ostrom herself was one of the greatest students of this method, and what makes the Bloomington School rather unusual is that it successfully spans across the entire continuum from very high-minded social and political philosophy all the way to the most hard-nosed empiricism. I think that captures very well the way in which working together, they realized you must always do both. And in these first chapters, he has five core chapters that are sort of meat and taters. And in those, the first couple of chapters are these Vincent Lynn connections, uh, the metropolitan governance studies, uh, the 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 uh, worry about gargantua or too large a government and, and centralization, and then the work on polycentricity. And so in those early chapters, that's where I think you really do get uh, the flavor of the two of them together. Um, but again, as I say, as it follows through the rest of the book, and then sort of halfway through the book, we really see Lynn take off. Uh, Vlad presents her work and where it goes from there. But what's so great about that is by that time, you really understand how she understood that you can have simple analytic theory, but it is not going to be adequate to the complex situations in which people find themselves when they are creating institutions uh, with which to govern. And so if, in fact, your theories are always too simple, you're never going to get to true understanding of what's happening there. Now, they did that through the police studies, through the metropolitan governance studies. Uh, they saw it on the ground. They saw how empirical tests could be manipulated. They saw how theory could be wrong or correct in different ways uh, that it came together, and they were always going back and forth. That sets the stage then for her to look at the game theory that she was examining with regard to public goods and common pool resources and say, that ain't going to cut it. I think game theory and analytic theory is critical for doing the kind of work I think is most important in the social sciences today. However, even though that's really critical, if we leave it at that level, we're going to get it wrong because people have a variety of things that are going on out there. The real world has lots of institutional arrangements and lots of solutions that people are self-interested and they're operating a lot in the way that people say they're operating, but they're not getting to this distilled tragedy that game theory was predicting at the time. And they saw it immediately because they had been in the field, because they had been always going back and forth between theory and the field and theory and empiricism. And so as a result, when she goes out to do her major work in this area, she says it's not enough to think tragedy will be everywhere because we look around and tragedy isn't everywhere. How in the heck are these people doing this? I need to understand that. 
And being the good empiricist that she was, she said, I got to get out there in order to study it. Mm -hmm. And so she does. And as um, Pete Becky was saying earlier, uh, she sends her army of people and graduate students and others around her to help her. And again, that was the Metropolitan Studies and things as well. Um, so anyway, she gets out there, she starts doing it, she starts creating then the type of models that uh, Vlad has already presented for us. But they didn't grow from that very complicated thing to start with. They rather grew from, well, we know these things, now what else do we need? And then drawing by a careful examination what was most critical, what was the same between this setting and that, how did the outcomes differ between those two. So that care that she always took allowed her to then start to draw a framework. That was a very challenging time for Eleanor Ostrom. She was the president of the Public Choice Society during this period when she was starting to develop all of the CPR models. And people in that society were pushing back on her because the whole logic was we can use these types of theory and they were getting more and more sophisticated in the mathematics. And Lynn and Vincent were very much pulling back from that and saying we can't go there too quickly. We can't race there. And so I think, again, at that stage in this book, we really see that uh, Vlad has presented for us the way that she makes this transition and then how it builds, how it builds until we get to it. And so um, I have just a little thing that I'm going to read because, and then I'll end with this. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom is best known for her path-breaking work on CPRs and for the development of these institutional analysis frameworks and meta-theories. Tarko does an admirable, if brief, and it is brief, I mean, when you see all this that he's going through, and it's like, what, 100 and... Less than 200. Yeah, less than 200 pages, so to do an entire career in that and do a, such a good job of summarizing this work and suggesting its cumulative impact on the field of political economy. But the greatest strength of his treatment in this volume rests largely on the way in which he sets the stage for these contributions in Ostrom's earlier work done in collaboration with Vincent and other colleagues from the workshop. Great social scientists such as Eleanor Ostrom are shaped by their formative interactions and intellectual puzzles. Undoubtedly, the constant obstacles she faced early on showed her to be resilient, my favorite chapter, the resilience chapter, enough to challenge the accepted view and look for the many paths to success which humans create for themselves. Through those same insights, she designed a career based in understanding other struggles to solve problems, and through Tarko's examination, we gain an answer to Lynn's own version of Hamilton's dilemma of whether careful reflection and choice can win out over accident and force. It can, she did, and Tarko does a great job of explaining how. Thank you. I uh, really miss having Bobby around IU. Uh, and uh, one thing I'd forgotten is how tough an act she is to follow. But, uh, but here we go. I want to thank uh, Peter and all of you associated with the Mercatus Center for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, Lynn Ostrom and Vincent and the workshop. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Lynn and Vincent very, very well over a period of 25 years, which was based as a colleague, which was basically my whole career, half a Lynn's and about a third of Vincent's. Give you some perspective here on all this. Um, and Vlad just did a wonderful job putting together an outstanding overview of the intellectual foundations for the, for the work that, that, of the research that Lynn ended up getting a Nobel Prize for in 2009, which would have been impossible without all this preceding sort of work. Um, and I mentioned the less than 200 pages. I mean, that just blows my mind that he was able to do it in less than 200 pages. I've been trying to put, put my, you know, wrap my mind around the work that's done around the workshop. 
Uh, so far, I've got seven edited volumes on that. Uh, <laughs> 200 pages is incomprehensible to me. So great job, great job. And it really hits the highlights, really hits the highlights. And I've got so many comments, it's, it's almost impossible for me. So someone may have to stop me here uh, before I get too far along. But basically, what I would like to do is go through his, his, uh, some aspects of his book, raise some things that I thought he really nailed right on the head and got really good uh, um, innovative ways of looking at this situation, even for someone who's sort of been enmeshed in it for a whole career. Um, and then suggest maybe a way in which he might have done a little more research in that, or his students or colleagues might do a little more research to really dig into some critical sort of points here. There's, this is not the end of a work on the intellectual history of the workshop. There's lots of other things that could be done. And then a few other points to say that uh, to, to identify where there are places where Lynn and Vincent, although they really had wonderfully open minds and were able to, to do incredible things, they had a few blind spots that they weren't willing to go in. They weren't willing to go into sociology as much as I think they should have. Uh, uh, and I'll talk about some of these areas respectfully, but, but that there are, there are ways in which this research tradition can be extended into other means approach too. Okay, first. Um, I love Vlad's comment about social reality as the sum of all existing action situations. There really is this sense that the IED framework is a way of looking at the world, uh, and he, he summarizes that really, really well. Uh, most other people who studied Lynn strained to see connections between this and the early police studies. The Nobel Committee wrote a great overview of Lynn's work and never mentioned polycentricity or police studies. It was a great overview, but it just missed the first two-thirds of her career or something. Um, I also really liked Lynn's, or excuse me, Vlad, Vlad's argument about this, this, the intentional stance being a way of separating organizations from institutions. Uh, and I really think this is an advance over, over the way Lynn was working on it. She never really, never really did a good job of really applying the ID framework to the structure of organizations. Uh, and in fact, one time I asked her about, you know, can an action situation be an organization? She said, no, an organization would have lots of different kinds of uh, action situations within it that are structured together in some way, and I thought that was kind of interesting, but she never really investigated that, and so there's still a lot of opportunity there. But more specifically to the, the, the reason why I'm here, I, it, it would be interesting to apply the IED framework to the workshop as an organization. Okay, to understand how that what worked as an organization and to understand how that contributed or grew within this broader intellectual tradition, this institutional framework of what we now call the Bloomington School or the workshop tradition or whatever sort of approach you want to do it. And I think there would really be a useful way to do that. And I want to talk a little bit about um, Studying the workshop as an organization, because we've mentioned this at lunch, there's a lot of archives that could be dug into in, the, in Bloomington on this and give you some ideas. Um, give you an example. Vlad talks about the importance of Buchanan and Buchanan and Tullock's book, The Calculus of Consent, on the early days in the workshop. Uh, and I think that's absolutely right. I remember when I first started hanging around there in the 1980s, they were talking about that stuff quite a bit. But over the years, because I sat in on the syllabi, on the on the seminar several times and and taught it several times at different points in my career, less and less of the Buchanan Tullock book was assigned each year, and those are all in the archives. So you can go track through this down. There's other stuff, other influences are coming in, uh, and at the very end, all the students ever saw, the new students saw, was the figure that showed you know the the two things, and that was all they got, uh, which was a very important idea. But the way Buchanan and Tullock explained it wasn't really that useful to the way the workshop. So the, the Ostroms had gone in a totally different direction and were interpreting it very differently. And you can sort of see that. I'll give another one with Oliver Williamson, you know, who shared the prize. Um, again, 1980s, um, uh, some of, uh, at least one of Williamson's book was required reading in the workshop. But then less and less and less. And, and whenever his name would come up, either Lynn or Vincent would say, well, you know, it's very important work and all that. But, but you know, it's not always about minimizing transaction costs. Sometimes it's really important to engage in transactions that generate a lot of costs and have a meaningful effect on individuals and how they see themselves. And that's the whole Tocqueville self-governance engagement and civic engagement sort of thing. And you miss that if you just look at the transactions. So it's another sort of approach. 
And I would say that one, one influence, there's a lot of influences on Lynn, and Vincent is, is there an incredible amount in, in this book, which is not always the case. Um, I'd encourage you to look at Herbert Simon a little bit more, okay? Uh, and Herbert Simon, you got the bounded rationality part. That's fine. Uh, and that's a very important part. But in the in, in light on your discussion of looking at these complex systems uh, and self similar kinds of systems, Lynn really thought about complex systems. I think the way Herb, Herbert Simon did, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the partial decomposability of systems, that you can't totally com decompose them into systems, and the partial systems are understandable, uh, and then you sort of see how things sort of emerge from that. But as I understand a lot of the field of complex adaptive systems, they're really at the system as a whole. And, and, and they kind of deny the fact that you can carve this thing up into little bits and pieces. And so there's, there's a disjuncture, I think an important way, between Lynn and others coming from the, the Ostrom tradition, look at systems in the way many of the complex analytic people. Now I'm not done with Simon yet, incredible, incredible uh, scholar. The only other political scientist to win the economics Nobel, by the way. But anyway, uh, as a political scientist, I have to you know, sort of pitch that in whenever I can. Um, Simon's book, Administrative Behavior, is really an influential, influential book um, decades ago, and I think it still is in, in uh, public administration fields. And he takes this notion of bounded rationality and says, how do you design an organization that takes advantage of the fact that individuals are boundedly rational, they can only pay attention to a certain number of things, how do you car, and that the system you're dealing with is partially decomposable so you can make this organizational structure, how do you match up the complexity of the of the decision environment with the complexity you're building inside in these structured sorts of organizations. Incredible amount of design in that. Uh, and um, I'll go here to, I, I kind of had to say this carefully, so let me go ahead and read directly from here. I can imagine a, a version of the Bloomington School in which it was fully accepted that many of the organizational entities operating within a polycentric system of governments were consciously designed by public entrepreneurs acting in exactly the way Simon talks about in administrative behavior. So, to understand how the workshop developed, one puzzle is why does the notion of planning have such a negative connotation among the Ostroms? Uh, and Vlad, you slip into this a little bit with a few comments about, dismissive comments about the futility of planning in complex systems which is all well and good because Vincent really did object to planning if someone thought they were designing the entire system as a whole. They just thought that wasn't feasible. But if you look at these polycentric systems and you break it down in these systems, these entrepreneurs at the lower level are doing an incredible amount of strategic behavior and planning and trying to solve problems and doing all of that. And it would be interesting to sort of see how that disjuncture sort of came up and there was this lack of understanding that planning is really sort of um, uh, a really important point. And I think one of the reasons that would really be important is there are other points where Vlad makes some really good comments that I took as an opportunity to think about these things a little bit differently and move down in another direction. I'll give you an example. Uh, you must have liked this one quote from the Delivery of Urban Services, uh, edited volume back in 76. You quote it twice on page 32 and page 108, okay? And there's that same quote. Well, basically, well, where Lynn says, quote, failure in many cases leads to the adopt, this is government failure in some sort of policy program. Failure in many cases leads to adoption of still another program, one often based, as, it wa as was the first, on inadequate analysis of the strategic behavior of the different actors Failure seems to breed failure, okay? Fine, Very, it's a wonderful sort of quote. And this sequential compounding of policy issues is something you really see if you look at policy. I've been studying health policy, I see a lot of those kinds of things, okay. Um, but the problem is that that statement can be taken too easily as sort of a almost ideological dismissal of the potential consequences or positive consequences of policy reform or other kinds of planning or it could have been read as encouraging institutional analysts to use the IED framework to develop a carefully specified model of the circumstances in which this kind of policy compounding would occur. 
not to say that how terrible this is, but how has it happened and how do we break that vicious cycle? How do we help people get out of that vicious cycle? How have other people gotten out of that vicious cycle uh, and solved their problems? And that Bobby was getting exactly into that. Uh, um, both Lynn and Vincent were very interested in learning from people how they got out of these situations and then trying to figure out how we could make this sort of some, some science out of that. Okay. And the problem is that my impression is that the way the Ostrom tradition has developed, and I'm part of it too, so I contributed to this, that's not the kind of question we would have asked within this tradition. And I think it's the kind of question that would really connect well to the mainstream policy literature and could really have some, some important sort of connections. Because the mainstream literature on public policy is all about the strategic choices made by public entrepreneurs at all different sorts of levels of analysis. So I think that's really one place where we could sort of make that connection. Um, okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about how I saw the ID framework. Your, your perspective on the ID framework was kind of interesting you're talking about here in Bobby's boxes within boxes within boxes. Um, workshop students and visiting scholars often ask me how they might have used the ID framework for their seminar papers. Basically about two-thirds of the way through the semester because that was, you know, when they started to think seriously about the paper they had to contribute to the seminar, which was applying the ID framework to some policy situation. So I, I got their attention at that point. So I would encourage them to think in the following way, ask the following sort of questions. Because you have to step back and, and think about this. Most of you have probably seen this to some extent. There's the operational level where policies are happening. There's the collective level, which is sort of the repository of all the policy options that these operational people might choose from. Uh, and then there's a constitutional level, which is the repository of all the actors who might write different kinds of rules up here. And so you're kind of moving back and forth in this, and that's, that's sort of the boxes within boxes. Okay, so, so you look at this, you've got something you don't like, you don't understand about a current policy situation at the operational level. Okay, so if the current procedure that, that these people are following biases the outcome in a way that you're not happy with, how could you step back to the collective choice processes and give the um, uh, uh, individuals uh, a better set of options to deal with it? Or how would the individuals design, des design for themselves a better set of options? Uh, if certain actor positions in an operational role have uh, incentives that generate perverse effects, where could you go to change that set of incentives? Or where would a practitioner, or excuse me, a practitioner, a participant in that system, how would they rethink their incentives or rethink their structures or rethink the organizations and the actors that are involved in this structure. And you would, so you would move up and down. You, you have a quote in the book, Glad, about zooming in and out of in organizations and institutions, the IED framework. I think it's more zooming in and out of action situations at different levels and different boxes and moving back and forth and, and going into the contextual conditions, the physic, biophysical conditions, the, the um, um, attributes of the community or the rules in use. And so basically, I tell the students to start with a focal action situation or a couple of them that's really important, and then move around in that system. Why is the system, why is that action situation set up the way it is? How could those conditions be changed? And in many times, the easiest way to do that is to talk to the people who've gotten out of a problem like that or, or see what they did. How did they rethink the problem? And, and if you look at Lynn's dissertation, which is not a, a widely seen, um, a widely cited sort of work, uh, she just went in there and talked to these people in Southern California about how they fixed this incredibly difficult problem with salt water infusion into their, into their water supplies. Uh, and there was no massive major sort of theory they were applying. They were just working through these problems and coming up with stuff that they could, they could come up with at some, some time to sort of work. Uh, and I think, I think I'll go actually, I've already mentioned that, to um, uh, Lynn's dissertation. Excuse me, here, yeah, Lynn's dissertation. Uh, because I think, because the dissertation was entitled Public Entrepreneurship, a Case Study in Groundwater Management. And public entrepreneurship is, is a theme that comes up in Vlad's book quite a bit. Because uh, it is a central concept. There are these actors that are taking these actions, uh, or these, these people, the people themselves are, are making changes in policy and, and developing new sorts of institutions. 
and they're doing it in a very creative way, and, and this is where you get this emergent sense of order that comes out of this interaction. None of them are trying to design the system as a whole. They're doing whatever they can to solve their particular problem, and out of all that comes um, some sort of emergent order. But there's a part of the way Lynn described it in her dissertation that I don't see in the ocean work since then. I was struck by it. I actually went back and looked at it. I haven't read the whole damn thing, okay? This was the introduction and conclusion to see what you said about public entrepreneurship. I've never thought that either Lynn or Vincent told us enough about how public entrepreneurs behave or should behave or what motivations they should be encouraged to have or how we would encourage the right kinds of motivations. I think that's still a big open question within this tradition. And so we say what she's saying. This is back in 1965, okay, so just starting off. Quote, entrepreneurs perform essential functions in organizing and guiding enterprises to provide the goods and services which are demanded as a condition of life in contemporary society. Uh, she may be writing a little more like Vincent in this sentence, but anyway, anyway sorry. Um, uh, but this is, she's talking about private and, and public entrepreneurs here. Frequently, individuals invoke public authority in their attempt to provide goods which are not readily exchanged in the market. They may seek to establish new laws which transform the basic operation of the market, or they may create public enterprises to provide those goods. And public entrepreneurs can exercise fundamentally different powers to develop, control, and allocate resources than can private entrepreneurs. They have access to the uses of eminent domain and taxation and other activities which extend the range of activities in which they engage. However, holders of these entrepreneurial positions within existing public enterprises are limited to the pursuit of specific opportunities, i.e. legal ones, utilizing only those powers assigned to them by legislation as interpreted by the courts. Public entrepreneurs, as a result, are much more intimately involved in the political process generally in order to be able to authorize and validate new programs of action and new institutional arrangements for accomplishing their purposes. Now, this sounds a little unlin like because her, she really became known for studying communities in very remote parts of the world with almost no connection to the government, solving problems far from the eyes of the, um, uh, the state or, or um, multinational markets. But this is where she started. Okay. And I think it's important to note that she makes an explicit reference to these situations where Public entrepreneur refers both to community organizers or citizens themselves and to public officials who are in these different public enterprises. And they're working together in some way. They're engaging with each other. And they're working together for different purposes. The community organizers trying to solve the problem, the public entrepreneurs trying to help people in a way that's consistent with their mission, uh, and yet working together in some way. And that connection, somewhere along the way, this, this openness to direct partnerships between public officials and community-based entrepreneurs was lost in most of the uh, uh, work done later by the Ostrom School. And that would be the kind of thing that an intellectual history could sort of, so how did this opposition to planning or this, this, um, uh, this stepping away from this approach. Now, in closing, I, I'm not intending this to be negative by any means. I, I love, I mean, I am a product of the, of the Bloomington School, very much within this tradition. Vlad's done a great job in summarizing this big picture in less than 200 pages, which I still don't believe. Uh, and, and there's a places in here, I'll send you these whole comments because I skipped over a lot of things, things you might sort of pursue. But I do wish there were, there were, there were a few places like this where, where Lynn and Vincent might be a little more open uh, to, in, to other sorts of approaches. But what I really wish is that they were still here to respond to my comments in person. Because I'm confident they would have treated them as constructive, but would probably also suggest a better way to go about what I'm trying to do, okay? I mean, they were incredible that way. Uh, and as a product of the Bloomington School, I feel like I need to share my enthusiasm for the unrealized potential of the conceptual frameworks and analytical tools that the Ostroms have left to us. And I'm really happy to be part of a community that is still engaged in those activities. Thank you. All right, well, uh, that's going to uh, bring us to the end. Please join me in thanking um, our panelists. And uh, 
I want to end with one one remark. Also congratulating Vlad. It is a tremendously uh, well written book, uh, and it uh, given that on the very first seminar that you gave as a student, you announced to all of us, "You are wrong." Uh, <laughs> this was one of the most generous uh, and 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 calm writings of a book that I could have imagined because I kept on thinking of you screaming at the pages, "You are wrong!" But instead, you were saying. This is really clear. Let me work on that. So I loved it, and uh, I greatly appreciate what you did with that. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the semester for 2018. Let's have a great semester. And thanks again, and congratulations, Brent, uh, Vlad. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.